And now it's uh, my absolute pleasure to introduce Cantor Laura Stein, LMSW, who was ordained from Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religions, Debbie Friedman School of Sacred Music in 2018. She also holds a Master of Social Work from NYU. Currently, Laura works full-time as a social worker at Mount Sinai Hospital's Center for Transgender Medicine and Surgery, and serves as cantor in various congregational, communal, and pastoral settings. It is my absolute privilege to welcome you. Thank you so much, Allison, and welcome to everybody. I'm going to pull up a presentation so we can have some visual cues tonight um, while we learn together. Okay, so welcome everybody. We're going to actually begin with, um, with Kavana with a, a prayer uh, that is very fitting for this presentation. If you know it, feel free to sing along on your end of things, muted of course, but we'll sing together if you know it. Adonai, Adonai, El Rahum Bechanun, Erech Apaim, Verachesed Vemet, Notzer Chesed La Alafim, Nose Avon Bafesha. Adonai, Adonai, God who is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, a God who preserves loving kindness to the thousandth generation, God who is forgiving of iniquity, hardening of willful sin and error, and a God who cleanses. We begin this evening with Adonai. Adonai, as we welcome each other, I welcome you to this presentation. Chag Sameach to everybody, and thank you for being here tonight to celebrate and to learn along with me. Um, as Allison uh, so warmly welcomed me, my name is Cantor Laura Stein. Um, I am a cantor, obviously. Um, I also have a license uh, in social work. I practice social work um, in clinical settings, and I practice my cantorial work in pastoral settings. So tonight's goal is to teach, to educate, to help us bring together the mental health perspective and the spiritual perspective as we learn about the 13 attributes of God using mental health intervention to emulate them. And just a disclaimer um, about uh, tonight, a few things. First of all, our goals are um, to, like I said, to find the intersection between our spiritual health and our mental health and to practice, we will do an exercise as well, to practice how we can be more like God. But I just want to caution, this is not a therapy session. However, if you do feel like what happens tonight is inspiring to you, or you want to learn more about these techniques, I would encourage you to either connect with me afterwards or to find a local practitioner in your area who would be able to help you dive a little bit deeper into how you can use some of these techniques in your own lives. And just one more thing, um, I will be using God God's uh, pronouns as him, his most generally. Um, this is a practice for me. Um, I hope that in your own study, you will use pronouns for God that you find to be the most appropriate for you. So we'll begin tonight learning about the 13 attributes, who God is and how we can be more like God by using some training to make ourselves a little bit better than we are right now. So we begin this evening um, by understanding the moral imperative, kind of why, why are we doing this? Why are we here? So Jewish tradition teaches that we are meant to emulate God's moral compassionate attributes by being uh, many things, and we'll go over all of them later. But for example, you might've heard uh, of being slow to anger, showing compassion, behaving with an abundance of kindness. But what happens when we can't be like God? We are not divine ourselves. We have divine sparks, but we are human. What happens when we find it challenging to be all the things that God is that we are supposed to emulate? So this session will explore mental health interventions to teach us skills so that we can reach that potential in our spirituality. Specifically, we're going to be answering or attempting to answer the question, how do we turn our anger into compassion? How do we be more like God, slow, being slow to anger and being more of a compassionate person? 
So we're going to go back um, to the Torah, learn about where it is that we first hear that we are supposed to be like God. Where does this idea come from? So we are first introduced to this idea in Genesis chapter one, verses 26 through 27, where we first hear that we are created B'Tselem Elohim, we are created in God's image. Vayivra Elohim et ha'adam b'tzalmo, b'tzalem Elohim bara oto. We learn that God created humans in God's image. We, uh, in the image of God, God created them, uh, God created us. So we see here that we are created with a divine spark in God's image. We'll go a little bit deeper into what that means in a moment. We also understand that we um, are reminded to walk in God's ways. What does it mean to walk in God's ways? Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 17, God states that by accepting the role of being God's chosen people, by being the chosen people and inheriting the promised land from God, we are saying, sure, God, we will walk in your ways. We will observe your laws and commandments, and we will obey you. So we are made in your image. We are meant to be like you, and we are meant to follow you, to walk in your ways. But just another disclaimer, we know that that humans were not created to be replicas of God. We're not supposed to be little gods uh, on the earth. We are supposed to instead learn from God and take inspiration from God's uh, divine qualities. Throughout our behavior day to day, we are supposed to have our little sparks of God within us that are supposed to help us to move toward goodness. Uh, Rav Cook writes in The Perplexed of the Generation, God says that we were created in God's image, but we, as we all know, we still have free will. We have the will to act however it is that we as human beings are going to act. So um, this, you know, comes from this kind of this idea, which we all probably know. Raise your hand if you have flaws, um, if you see yourself as a human being who has inclinations, who has tendencies, um, who has proclivities towards things that maybe aren't the best. We as human beings are flawed. This is an expectation. We are not supposed to be not flawed. If we were not flawed, we ourselves would be God. But we have flaws because we are not God. Instead, we are tasked with this giant responsibility, this struggle of what it means for us to go throughout our lives holding two things at once, that we can tame our humanness and become more like God. This is a holy, holy task. This is our purpose here on earth. This is life's uh, purpose for us here that we are supposed to recognize that we are human, tame that humanness within us and strive to be more like God because we are meant to believe that God is perfect. And again, we'll go uh, in more into that in just a moment. So just to look at this again, but Salam Elohim, we know that um, we are supposed to be God's mirrors here on earth. If, um, if we were entirely like God, again, we, there'd be no no reason for God or for God's Torah, because we would be perfect. We would already know everything. And if we were just animals and we didn't have any sort of uh, divine spark within us, there'd be no reason for God to even exist or have authority. So it's really this tension, this balance between we are flawed, but we also have promise. We have potential to be better. Um, just a quote from Sarah Vowell, the uh, novelist who says, we are flawed creatures, all of us. Some of us think that that means that we should fix our flaws, but get rid of my flaws and there would be no one left. So obviously um, a little bit of satire here. We're not completely flawed, but the idea being that it is our flaws um, that make us who we are as much as everything else. So the goal is not to completely get rid of our flaws, rather to learn how to sublimate them to turn them into something productive here on earth. We see here that um, that we are made of a divine tapestry or we are part of God's greater plan. But again, we also have our own behavior. We have choices and we have free will. So tonight we'll be discussing, discovering what it looks like for us to weigh these two things at the same time. So if we're going to be like God, if we're going to imitate this being, uh, it's it's important that we begin by knowing who this being is that we're meant to emulate. So who is this God that we're supposed to emulate and what are the qualities in God that we are meant to imitate or emulate in our daily life? Let's go back to answer this question. We'll go back to the sin of the golden calf. You probably can think back to your own days in Hebrew school when you probably colored in a drawing or did some sort of art project to understand 
what the Israelites were going through in this moment of this, the sin of idolatry. You might know from the Ten Commandments, we are not meant to, uh, to commit the sin of idolatry. So we're going to look at what happens in Exodus 32, and you'll see um, this cartoon here, which obviously uh, hyperbolically demonstrates or, or depicts what happened in this moment. So Moses goes up to Mount Sinai to speak with God, and the people become very worried. They're looking around. They're saying, we used to have a leader. God spoke through that leader, and now we've been abandoned. Moses has gone away. He's gone for a long time. We need somebody to keep us uh, holy, to keep us safe, to look after us, to protect us. Um, to be our authority figure. And the Israelites take their gold from their jewelry, they throw it into a pot, they, I guess, me uh, meld it, and they turn it into this structure, this idol that they are going to worship. And um, the people feel a lot better knowing that they now have this figure that they can uh, idolize that will, you know, through their idolization, will, will love them back, will keep them safe. But of course, we know God hasn't actually abandoned the people. God is just busy in conversation with Moses. So what happens when Moses comes down and God is out of that conversation and sees what the people have done? God becomes very, very angry. And we know God's wrath can be uh, pretty bad, bad enough that sometimes it kills entire people, uh, entire peoples, it destroys lands. God's wrath, uh, God's angry wrath is incredibly, incredibly uh, powerful. And so God says, okay, so you don't need me anymore. You have offended me in this way. You don't need me. You can just pray to this golden structure you have made. And what was this promise we made to one another? I thought we, we were in a covenant with each other, that we had an agreement. You were going to be my chosen people, and I was going to protect you and give you meaningful lives through my Torah. But I guess you don't need me anymore. Therefore, I'm just going to obliterate you. I have no need for you anymore. And of course, the people say, wait, 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 we didn't, we didn't actually mean it. That's, that's not what we meant. Um, and God is still very, very angry. What happens in the next chapter, Exodus 33, Moses, the prophet of the, of the people, uh, goes to God and says, please, please don't abandon the people. Um, you promised us you would take us to the promised land. You promised that you would protect us, that you would be there for us, that you would give us these laws that promised us to have meaningful lives. Please don't abandon us now. They didn't mean it. They were scared. They didn't know where I had gone. They didn't know where you had gone. Um, please, please don't be angry with, with us, with my people, with your people. Um, and in Exodus 33, God takes a breath and God says, um, okay, I can forgive them. Um, in fact, not only will I show compassion, but I'm actually going to show you exactly who I am. I'm going to show you this great compassion that I have, that yes, I have been greatly offended by my people who have abandoned me, who have idolized this golden calf and who have said, God, we don't need you anymore. We'll just take on this golden calf as our God instead. And yes, I can forgive that. Um, and in fact, I'm going to show you just how compassionate I can be by revealing my qualities to you. So God lets um, himself or God lets God's self be known. The next chapter, Exodus 34, verse 5, God comes down in a cloud. Um, and in 6 and 7, God reveals himself to Moses and through Moses to the Jewish people. So it says here in Exodus 34, verse 6, it says, Vayavor Adonai al Panav veikra. So God said, Adonai, Adonai el Rachum vechanun erech apaim vrav chesed veemet. Notzer chesed la alafim no se avon vefesha chataa ve nake. So you might have recognized these words from what we sang earlier in our session when we opened up. The Lord passed before Moses and said, God, I am God. I am compassionate and gracious. I am slow to anger. I am abounding in kindness and faithfulness, extending kindness to the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. So you might notice here a kind of lack of awareness on God's part. God says, look at me. I am compassionate. I am slow to anger. Now, when I read this, I think to myself, well, that's funny because only two chapters earlier, you actually became incredibly quick to anger when the people left you. So 
here you are um, bragging kind of about who you are and what these qualities are that you claim to have, but your behavior doesn't always show that. And we, we just saw that actually happen. So what do you mean, God? What do you mean you're slow to anger? But these, again, aspirational um, as they may be, God says, these are my qualities. This is the essence of who I am. So this essence of God becomes such an essence, becomes so known um, that we now, moving forward, come to know God by these attributes. For example, in Joel chapter 2, verse 13, Joel speaks to the people about this impending day of judgment um, when the nation, when the Israelites will be accountable for their sins. And Joel says to the people, rend your hearts rather than your garments, meaning bring your hearts to, to this place of spirituality, of connection with God. Don't try to give things off your back, really give of your hearts. Turn back to God, for God will be, God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in kindness, renouncing of punishment. In Psalm 145, 8, David kind of invokes the same thing. Um, while God is, while David is praising God, God, uh, David says, God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in kindness. So you can see that this, this quote that God said, I am, actually becomes a part of God's title. God, people start to refer to God, not only as God, but as God who is gracious, gracious, compassionate, slow to anger. So these attributes are not only attributes, they are part of really God's identity. In Jonah chapter four, verse two, um, the subject of Ninevite vindication from sin and punishment, Jonah speaks to God and to God um, himself, God says, I know that you are compassionate and a gracious God. I know that you are slow to anger. Now, again, we'll go back and think, well, how much is God really like these things? But, but again, we'll get to that in a moment. Really what we're focusing on is the idea that God believes that God, that this is who God is, God is. It is aspirational even for God. And that God says, in my best version of myself, this is who I strive to be. And therefore, human beings, little people down there, this is who you should strive to be too. So does God always live by these attributes? Like I said, not always. Um, God is a complex character and God's behavior doesn't always cohere with who God claims to be or what um, what the virtues are that God, God claims to have. In fact, in that same verse in Exodus 34, 7, God, when God finishes saying, I will forgive you, God then says, but I'm going to visit the iniquity um, of all of your gen future generations to check in and make sure that sin has actually properly been eradicated kind of from your family line. Okay. Um, I want to make sure there, I can't see, oh, wait, here's the chat. I just want to make sure that the chat, okay, wonderful. Um, and this, um, this balance in God's self-description, I believe that this is kind of part of that mirror when we say in God's image, we see in God this struggle and we can see it in ourselves too. So we see here that God is compassionate but God's also very angry. We might think back, for example, to the first sin in, um, at, in the story of Adam and Eve with the tree of knowledge, of knowledge of good and evil. We see there that God becomes very angry, enough so to, to expel them from the garden. Um, we can think back to Noah's flood. We can think of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. We can think of so many times, if not even just the golden calf, when God is actually very angry, very quick to anger. Um, but we also know God to be a compassionate, forgiving um, God in examples like jo um, Jonah or examples where we in our own lives might pray to God and feel that God is responsive to us. But the purpose here being that God's self-definition in some way mirrors or defines our human struggle, which is that even if we aspire to be the best, we don't always live up to our best. So here I've underlined what I think kind of is sums up uh, this portion of the presentation. Sometimes even God struggles to be like God. And when we struggle to be like God, we can take comfort in knowing that even God struggles to be like himself or like God's self. 
So you may be wondering, okay, this is all interesting, but what's my role in this? What does this have to do with human beings? So uh, Rabbi Shai Held, um, who co-creator, co-founder of Machon Hadar, says that God, God is a bit of a risk taker. God has taken an enormous risk and that the risk is that God will continue to be disappointed by us but that God needs us. God created human beings, not just because God was bored, but because God actually had a need that we would walk around the earth, that we would contain within us a spark of godliness or God's essence, and that we would, through our own acts of loving kindness, we would bring about or make manifest God's existence. And this infinite love that Shai Held here is talking about is that God continues to be disappointed in us because raise your hand. Did you even mess up just today doing something? You said, you know, I'm going to be super kind when I call customer service, or I'm going to be really patient when I get to this uh, traffic jam that I'm approaching. And maybe we, we weren't because, you know, being human is very hard, but God's infinite love is that God says, that's okay. Try again, try again tomorrow. I'm going to continue to need you to try. And this, again, is our holy purpose. It is um, something that, that we are tasked or commanded to do here on earth. I just want to read something that Lillian had written, enlightening to perceive God as struggling to be like God. Yeah, so you'll see here that we talk about compassion, and you might actually find that you have compassion for God, that you might say, I didn't think God needed anything from me, but in fact, I see God struggling in all of these moments when God throws fire, brings floods, kills, you know, thousands of people. I have compassion because for God to get that angry, God must be having a really hard time. Okay, so we're going to go here now to the liturgy, pray them to live them. Um, You may remember from your experiences in synagogue, or maybe this is a new concept for you that our liturgy um, includes the 13 attributes. So that song uh, that I sang at the beginning, Adonai, Adonai, Rahum Vechanun, is one, a very popular melody. There's lots of different melodies that um, are sung to bring about these attributes, but they are included in our liturgy. And that's because we are not meant to simply read them in the Torah and then go on our merry way. We are meant throughout our liturgical calendar to be reminded constantly, wait a minute, before you leave these synagogue walls, before you go back to the parking lot, get in your car and go home and go to go to work the next day, we want you to remember who you are supposed to be when you leave this space. So we'll look at examples of when the liturgy includes 13 attributes um, in the Slichot service, uh, in the month of Elul, in Rosh Hashanah morning Torah service, in the Yom Kippur evening service, um, in the Bidui section, Yom Kippur morning Torah service, three times in the Slichot section of Ne'ila. So obviously these are very high holiday heavy, but then also in the Torah service of every holiday, as long as it doesn't fall on Shabbat, we are meant to recite the 13 attributes. And you might say, well, okay, so we recite them, you know, so what? Well, that's the purpose of our presentation today is how do we actually take something that we're commanded to do and actually turn it into action, especially when it's really hard to change your behavior. So um, I've put something at the bottom here, which I think adds some strength, which is that Um, If you've been in a synagogue setting, you know that we recite these aloud. The 13 attributes are not something that we are going to say privately to ourselves. We can say them privately to ourselves, but the musical settings especially are meant to be sung communally. And this is because we look around, we see our colleagues, our friends, our family around us in the synagogue pews, and we say, you know, you are human just like me. We have a common humanity. And I'm going to leave the synagogue today, and so are you, and we're both going to try. We're going to try our hardest to take this commandment to be like God, and we're going to really, really try despite the fact that it's hard. And hearing hundreds, maybe even sometimes thousands of people singing it at the same time is going to help me to feel supported in this struggle of being human. So the next time you're in synagogue and you hear Adonai, Adonai, Look around and recognize that every person, child, adult, um, somebody who might be elderly, everybody is singing them, including the clergy, by the way, to say, I, I need this reminder 
for me, that I need to be better, that I need to be like God. And I can see here in the strength of the community that we're all in this together. We're all here to support each other. We all have this common struggle as human beings. Um, I'm gonna sing another melody. Um, it is tradition that we sing Adonai Adonai three times during a service. So I started with it. This will be the second recitation. And of course we'll end with it later. This is a melody that comes from Turkey. Adonai, Adonai, El Rahum Vehanu, Erecha Paim Vera Veser Vemet, No se Selafim, No se Avon Vafesha, Vehata Avena Ke. And we'll just translate it again, just to remind us what are these 13 attributes that we're talking about. We say Adonai, Adonai, God who is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and kindness and truth, who preserves loving kindness to the thousandth generation, is forgiving of iniquity, pardoning of willful sin and error, and who cleanses. So you can imagine yourself being in Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur or any holiday service, saying these things to yourself, walking out to the parking lot, and seeing a humongous traffic jam. Everybody's trying to get home, trying to leave services at the same time. And you become very quick to anger. You're honking your horn. You're saying, I gotta get home. I'm starving. I've been in synagogue all day. And you say to yourself, oh, right. I just recited Adonai, Adonai, God who I am meant to emulate, who is, for example, slow to anger. Well, let me see if in this moment, I myself can be slow to anger. This is an example. Of course, we could use any of these attributes in our daily lives, but being slow to anger, I'm thinking, probably comes up a lot, um, it, at least it does for me. So this brings us to the human struggle. Well, we can picture ourselves again in that parking lot, honking our horns, trying to get out, shoving other people in our minds saying, move out of the way, I, you know, I'm the only person in this struggle. But of course we recognize it is in fact a common, a human struggle among all of us. So let's go through the 13 attributes and see what it looks like to embody them. So the first uh, three of them are God announcing God's presence, announcing God's identity. We'll go to number four. God uh, wants us to be compassionate. Uh, the, the root of rahum, of compassion, um, is resh chet mem and this is the same as the root for the for the word for a womb so you can picture that when you are compassionate for a person it is as though you are enveloping them in a womb you are taking them in and you are showing them that you are there with them number five we are meant to be gracious uh we show favor and grace upon people, especially people who are undeserving. When have you ever been in a situation where somebody yelled at you and you wanted to yell back? Raise your hand. That happens all the time. Or somebody honks at you and you honk right back. Um, or somebody it pushes you and all you want to do is punch them right back. But instead, we are meant to be gracious, to say, well, you don't really deserve. Um, you've just been yelling at me. You don't really deserve my grace. But I am supposed to be that way. I am supposed to do everything I can in my power to be that way. And so in this moment, I'm going to try my hardest to be like God. I'm going to try my hardest to shower you with grace and favor, uh, even if I might feel like you're undeserving of it. Number six, slow to, uh, slow to anger. Obviously, we have seen this a lot and discussed it a lot. Patiently waiting for, uh, for the other person to maybe come to their senses um, or uh, to, for them to repent. Uh, number seven, abounding in love, loving kindness. So to both the righteous and the unrighteous, you might think of God as somebody who um, punishes the bad and celebrates the good. And I actually think of God that way myself. But again, as an aspirational quality, God says, I will show loving kindness to everybody because I understand that people are flawed and people are struggling and people are just trying their best. Number seven, truth. God is um, a God that is fair and equitable um, in God's justice. We know that we ourselves are meant to be honest, are meant to be truthful, are meant to be equitable, equitable, fair, and just in our actions as well. Number nine, keeps loving kindness for the thousands, meaning um, doesn't just promise 
this covenant to you, but makes a covenant with the people, your children, your children's children, that this is an eternal promise. Number 10, forgives iniquity. So forgives intentional sin. If you meant to hurt somebody, you can still be forgiven, um, at least according to God's aspiration of who God is. Number 11, um, rebellious sin. Uh, forgives trans transgression that might be rebellious um, as well. And number 12, forgives a sin uh, that was an accident. So oftentimes we might mess up, break a law, uh, break a, a personal cover covenant between us and a friend or a family member, and we don't mean to, but that is still deserving of uh, forgiveness. And finally, a God who cleanses, who says, I can wash away that sin and you can start anew. So these are the attributes that we are meant to, uh, to embody or to emulate. And I'm sure plenty of you are thinking to yourselves, um, that seems like a really tall order. Uh, like we said earlier, even God can't always be all of these things at the same time. But again, we view these as being aspirational, as being something that we are trying or striving to be like. So raise your hand if you see yourself in any of these uh, little cartoons here, if you have ever lied or been lied to, um, if people have ever been rude to you or if you've been rude to others. Um, I, for some reason, was thinking a lot about the New York City subway when I was uh, creating this presentation, thinking about people who, who shove you and you're like, you get very angry and you're like, don't shove me. You know, I have my, per my right to personal space. Um, those of you who have a trouble forgiving say, I'm going to hold on to this grudge because actually there's something kind of pleasurable about that pain of holding on to, um, of holding on to a grudge and of not letting go. So we see ourselves in these, uh, in these cartoons here. Um, can you please download these attributes? So I'm going to give, uh, uh, give you access to all of this afterwards. You can do so by contacting me. We'll talk about that later. Um, okay. Um, so here we have, um, we have all of these things that all of us can see in ourselves, uh, maybe even just today just on this uh, Sunday, you did, did one of these things, either you were rude or you experienced someone being rude. Um, you might've lied or been lied to. We see the, the struggle for humanity, for humanness all around us. Of course, all of us on, uh, on this call today are human, unless you might have a furry friend with you, but all of us are human. And so we experience, we know this experience of what it means to, to really struggle. So we're going to break down the attributes um, into two categories. The category that, um, that asks us to be forgiving of punishment and slow to anger, and then the part that asks us to be compassionate. I've drawn an, drawn an arrow because I believe there is a connection, that it's not that, that these um, attributes exist in their own silos, but rather that they um, beget each other or that there's a flow from one to the other. So for example, Anger might become compassion if we know how to actually to do that, to change the anger into the compassion. Um, we might find uh, that we want to punish somebody, but in fact, we then can become forgiving. So you see here that there's um, somebody pulling out their hair. They are quite angry, um, but instead here, they can move to a place of being compassionate. Obviously, this girl with the magenta hair is um, comforting or being compassionate towards somebody who who appears to be suffering. So the big question that, that I posed at the beginning of this presentation is, how do we move from anger to compassion? Just to remind you, the sin of the golden calf, God is very angry. God says, I can't believe you would disobey my commandment that you are not supposed to idolize. Um, and here you've made this calf, this golden calf. I can't believe you would abandon me like this when we made this promise to one another but I'm going to be compassionate. I'm going to see that you were suffering. You, the Israelites were suffering when you did this. You didn't do it because you said, "Never mind, we don't need God, you know, uh, or dissing God or saying, you know, we're over you, that the people were really suffering, really feeling alone, really feeling abandoned and really started to panic and said, well, if God's not gonna be here for us, we need somebody, we need something that's going to watch over us, that's going to be this spiritual model for us. And here we can make um, we can make a golden calf. So God says, 
okay, I was angry. You're right. I did start off as being angry, but I was able to move to a more compassionate place once I recognized your suffering, you meaning the Israelites. So the big uh, question here is, well, how do we turn anger into compassion? Um, we uh, probably find it really challenging to do so. Uh, raise your hand either on Zoom or physically, or if you just wanna quietly raise a hand inside of your own body. Um, who has ever found that when you are angry, it's really hard to convert that anger or sublimate that anger into anything else? Um, I, I have. Um, so I'm sure as humans, we all probably have experienced at one time or another that when we become angry, it's a very powerful emotion. So we're going to look just at, um, at this for one second. The... Um, the compassion first model, which we're going to talk about later, says that while anger itself is not adaptive, it's not like a particularly great or productive emotion, it can actually be productive because it begins a process. It begins a process uh, through which people can communicate, give each other feedback, and make changes. That that anger is the start, the catalyst for a reaction that will hopefully bring us to a place of change. The compassionate responses to anger expression model shows that. Um, that if we try to get rid of anger, if we say, I'm just not going to be angry, we, we're not, we don't actually, we're not that productive. What we want instead is to actually take the anger and sublimate it, convert it into something else. So not to get rid of it entirely, but to move it to a different place. So it's the compassion model says, rather, we want to not get rid of or eradicate the anger, but we want to sublimate it into understanding through communication, relationship building, maybe policy change, um, and that we can be more compassionate when we're able to take that anger and not just try to get rid of it, but use that emotion, use the power that we feel inside and actually convert it into something more positive like compassion. Let's look at why we get angry. Uh, probably such a common experience that we, um, you know, can look to our own experiences. So anger has the ability to take us uh, to a very extreme emotional place. It can be destabilizing. It can distance us from the needs of the other person. It can uh, overshadow the potential for pro-social behavior, for behavior that, um, that brings us together. So raise your hand again if you have ever been so angry that it, it destabilizes you, that you need to go into a separate room and shut the door. You really need to isolate yourself because the anger is just so powerful. Um, but we know that anger also has a, a positive uh, reason for existing. It's, it actually can be um, productive or healthy. We know that it's protective, that sometimes if we feel like we're going to really explode, like maybe we're gonna really hit somebody or say something we don't mean, that that anger can help us to, to recognize, oh wait, I've escalated to a real place where I need to maybe isolate myself. Um, anger can be helpful in expressing uh, disappointment when our expectations have not been met. And although on its own, it can be maladaptive, it can be healthy to let things out, to really express how you're feeling and to let others know what you need. Um, so anger is not pro-social, meaning on its own, it's not something that brings you closer together, right? It's very rare that you would say, oh, my best friend, she's the angriest person I know, I love her. You know, it's not usually on its own a, a best quality, but it can be empowering for people. And so in a moment, it can help to illuminate, oh, wait, there's something below the surface here. There's something that I need to do with this anger to really make it uh, positivity, maybe to bring God about in the world. We've got some good uh, comments in the chat. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Lillian. So reframing, redirecting the emotion. So taking the anger and saying, I'm feeling something big and I'm not gonna try to deny that. To not feel would to not be human, right? We are sentient human beings. We want to be able to express, uh, to feel our anger, but we want to try to redirect or reframe that emotional reaction to be something more positive, again, to bring about God. Um, and Jerome says it can help to guide us in recognizing characteristics within our being that perhaps we've not recognized and give us an opportunity to improve or heal ourselves. So recognizing that we do feel is a way for us to say, oh, wait a minute, there's there's something going on here. Um, let me try to see what's going on and try to heal or build upon it in a more positive way. Um, so that positivity brings us to compassion. When you think of compassion, you probably think of 
of positivity um, because compassion is meant to be something that is pro-social, meaning it brings us together. It helps to create connection among us um, and our family and our friends and society, um, and again, to bring about God. So how do we define compassion? Um, compassion is, is a feeling that arises when we witness another person's suffering and it motivates a subsequent desire to help. So it's not simply empathy or it's not simply sympathy, which says, I see that you're in pain. It's not empathy, which says, I relate to that pain. It goes even a step further to say, I'm going to help bring you from this place of suffering. I want to be a part of making you feel better. So we see, uh, just like Lillian uh, was saying earlier, compassion uh, can help sublimate um, anger into a more productive outcome. We can reframe, we can redirect, um, and um, compassion means we take action, exactly. So you might know, uh, like I said before, sympathy to be something where you say, oh, I feel sad for that person. I see somebody suffering. I, I feel sad, but that's it. It kind of stops at the feeling. Empathy would be, you know, I can relate to that struggle. And compassion would be not only do I feel bad and not only can I relate, but I'm going to take action. I'm going to be motivated to actually look at this person and say, let me enter into your sadness with you so I can help you out. Uh, so that I can help bring you out of it. I'm reminded of this uh, this amazing anecdote. I think it came from the West Swing. I think that's where I know it from, where somebody is in the bottom of a pit and um, people keep passing by, looking down like, like at the bottom of a, of a well, and they say, um, the person says, help me, help me. And the person, someone says, let me get a rope. I'll be right back. The next person says, you know, help me, help me. And the next person says, I'll get a ladder. I'll be right back. And, you know, a third person walks by and the person says, you know, I'm stuck at the bottom of the well. Help me, help me. And uh, the person starts, you know, jumps right into the well. And the person turns to the person and says, I don't understand. I, I needed your help to get out. Now we're both stuck in the bottom of the well. And the person says, yes, but I've been here before and I know how to get out. So the idea about compassion is not that we just throw someone a rope, but that we really enter into their suffering and we say, I'm going to take my own anger and I'm going to take whatever it is you are feeling and together we're going to move to this place of compassion. And you can see actually in God's story um, of the golden calf that God really does this. God doesn't disappear you know, to God's uh, throne, sit there and say, well, I was really angry. Let me see what I can do. God actually enters back into relationship with the Israelites because God knows that God cannot become more compassionate without really entering into the suffering of the people and saying, oh, I see why you were suffering. Wow, it must have been very scary for you to be at the bottom of Mount Sinai and feel abandoned. That must have been very scary. Let me enter into the suffering with you so that like the person at the bottom of the well, I've been here before, I can help you out. Okay, how can we cultivate compassionate responsiveness? We can do this um, first by being aware of another person's suffering. This comes from the cognitive place. So in your mind, just becoming aware of somebody else and their suffering. Um, the affective component feeling. So feeling sympathetic concern or being moved by that suffering. Um, third, an intention, setting an intention saying, I want to help. Um, I want to help you. Uh, relieve yourself of that suffering and then motivating, like we were saying before, saying, okay, I'm here and I'm going to take action with you to actually do that relieving, to actually relieve you of that suffering. I'm just being mindful of the time. I see we have about 10 minutes left. So I'm going to go a bit uh, swiftly through these slides so we can make sure we get to our exercise. Um, so how can we apply these? How can we be more compassionate, basically? How can we be like God and take our anger and sublimate it into this compassionate place? Well, um, the compassionate, the idea of compassionate mind training, which at the beginning I had said, you know, if you feel moved by any of these therapeutic approaches, please go find a practitioner who practices compassionate mind training. You can actually go to sessions and learn how to be more compassionate. So this theory works to increase an individual's capacity to access, tolerate, and cultivate affiliative emotions or pro-social emotions so that individuals can stay connected, especially during times of great conflict. So not I'm in a fight with somebody, I'm going to isolate or I'm going to ghost them or I'm going to just stonewall them, but instead saying, you know, I'm going to increase my ability, I'm going to train my mind to be more compassionate. And there are theories, um, there are 
people, uh, there are these therapies out there that you might be sitting here saying, well, I want to be like God. Sure. I pray, you know, I pray the 13 attributes, but I need something more than that. Well, there is, there are compassionate mind training. For example, there are other uh, therapies as well that can help a person really take this journey and move from a place of anger to a place of compassion. So compassionate mind training helps individuals reconcile the thoughts, the feelings, so the cognitions and the emotions and their behaviors that might make it hard for them to stay connected with other people and instead supplants them or replaces them with compassionate focus, focused responsiveness. To culti uh, cultivate compassion, I want everybody to think of a time right now, if you can very quickly, just pull up in your mind a time when you have found it really hard to be compassionate. So I'm going to use the example I used earlier. I don't know why it's coming to mind. I haven't been on the New York City subway system in over a year, but um, I do have ultimately compassion connection with yourself. Jerome, you are um, stealing my thunder because we're gonna get there, but yes, that's exactly what we're talking about. Um, so I'm gonna go back to my example of being on the subway. Somebody shoves me, they're kind of in a bad mood, they shove me. Um, what do I want to do to become more compassionate? Well, I need to be aware of three different things. The first one is, what is the threat? Um, in this case, it's a physical threat. Somebody pushed me and, and it's not, it doesn't feel good to have your personal space invaded in that way. But I need to start by understanding, okay, I feel threatened physically. Then I want to understand my excitement system, meaning I have a goal here um, and I have a very emotional right now. I'm very excited. Um, but I need to stay uh, remembering what my goals are. If my goals are to remember, uh, if my goals are to be like God out in the world, then I need to take that excitement and I need to direct it towards that goal so that my excitement doesn't turn into, for example, me shoving the person back. If I say to myself, well, I want to be a good person in the world who doesn't do things like that, I need to be aware of my excitement just to make sure it's being directed in the right way. And the third thing would be um, re-engaging with your safeness system or soothing system um, and keeping us attached. So you might have put on, for example, a soothing song after you've had a bad experience, or you might call somebody and say, I just needed to hear your voice. Keeping us connected to the things that make us feel safe, uh, safe and soothed is something that can be very, very uh, helpful in these moments when we feel like we want to be more compassionate, but we don't know how to do so. Um, I don't know that we have so much time, but if you wanted to go through compassionate mind training, you would look and see kind of what are the steps. I'll just go very quickly through them, remembering um, what we need in order to take care of ourselves, educating ourselves on the intervention, on what it means to do this kind of training, um, using a psychodynamic approach, meaning looking back um, and seeing what's worked for me in the past. Well, I'm a person who responds really well to X. Maybe in this moment, I can use that too. Um, building compassionate capacity. So increasing our ability to be compassionate through imagery te uh, techniques and breathing techniques, using behavioral exercises. There's plenty of them. You can draw what it means to be compassionate. You can write a letter to somebody who really deserves or needs your compassion. And then um, engaging in the various states, self states like um, the sad self, the angry self, and listening to yourself when you might find yourself in those moments. Again, this is a very, very cursory overlook, uh, overview of, of what we're talking about today, but I encourage you to look further into it um, when we leave this session. Okay, um, this brings us to, I think Jerome, it was you who mentioned uh, bringing it back to the self. Um, so uh, I'm just looking at the questions here. How does CMT work with gang members or how can you can be, be compassionate towards your tormentor? Um, thank you, the, this is very hard. And again, we don't have um, enough time tonight to address kind of on the larger scale when we might feel that somebody has wronged us maybe by, by murder or by something that we feel is really unforgivable. We don't have time to address that today, but I will say that self-compassion kind of is, the, is what we arrive at here. It is maybe the antidote. Um, for example, how do you feel, how do you become compassionate towards somebody else? Well, we, we need to begin with being compassionate towards ourselves. So Kristen Neff and uh, Christopher uh, Germer created self-compassion. It is a way to really connect with ourselves. It is a radical idea that says that we can be accepting of our own weaknesses and we can actually love ourselves. Self-compassion asks that we are willing to openly observe our negative thoughts and emotions so that we can be aware. So again, like we said earlier in the session, not saying, 
you know, I feel bad today, but I'm going to put it aside. But that we openly say, I feel bad today. And, you know, I was going to go for a run, but instead I think I'm going to be more compassionate. I'm going to do something that I really need to do. Like maybe I'm going to be easier on my body. I'm going to take a bath. Or maybe um, I was supposed to call that person who I don't always, you know, sometimes I feel maybe antagonized by them or it's a stressful conversation. I'm going to postpone that because I'm kind of needing a little more strength today. And I'm going to call someone that I really love. So um, having self-compassion begins with really looking at ourselves and saying, all right, I'm having a hard time today. That's okay. I can take this radical approach and I can sit in my weakness and my flaw today and I can really be with myself today. Um, again, lots to go over, not so much time, but self-compassion uh, asks us to be kind. It says it's an active process to avoid self-judgment, um, to be self-soothing to see one's experience as part of a larger human experience, to uh, avoid the kind of why me attitude, but rather to recognize we all go through this um, and to take a balanced approach um, of not being too connected to our experience in that moment, not feeling like our flaws define us, for example. Um, so we're gonna end this evening with a short meditation. I'm going to ask um, everybody to close their eyes. This is a meditation that comes from the self-compassion theory. Um, it was created by Christopher Germer, who says, you cannot show compassion towards others. You cannot manifest, he's not a religious guy, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but you cannot um, manifest God's compassionate trait unless you begin with yourself. So I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes, put your hand over your heart, um, and have loving awareness with yourself. So you're going to uh, take a few deep, relaxing breaths and notice how your breaths nourish your body as you inhale. Now you're going to focus your attention on your in-breath. So as you take that breath in, let yourself feel everything in your body expand. Let yourself feel where the oxygen goes. Let your body feel nourished by this breath. And as you breathe, breathe in something good for yourself, whatever you need. Right now, I need a little bit of patience because I'm feeling rushed by the time. So I'm gonna breathe in patience for myself. Okay, now we're going to focus um, on our out breath. So when we release that breath, you're going to call to mind someone that you love or just someone who you know is struggling right now. You're going to visually uh, visualize that person clearly in your mind. And we're gonna breathe in and give ourselves what we need. And we're going to breathe out and direct compassion or what that person needs towards them. I'm picturing myself on the subway, breathing in patience, saying I'm not gonna punch this person. And when I breathe out, I direct towards them a sense of compassion because I recognize that in order to have shoved me, they must be having a pretty crummy day. So we say in for me, out for you. You focus first on what comes in that makes it possible for you to feel compassionate and what goes out that makes it possible for you to share that with another person who might be struggling. So we're gonna open our eyes. We have just one minute left. And with that minute, I'm going to share my screen again so that we may end with, um, with our final recitation of Adonai Adonai. This time I'm going to do it in, uh, in English uh, with the same melody we began with. Yud hey, vav hey, compassion and tenderness, patience, forbearance, kindness, awareness, bearing love from age to age, lifting guilt and regret, and making us free. So um, we end tonight with this prayer that we all might leave tonight remembering the third attributes of God, remembering that even God struggles to be this way, so it's okay if we struggle, but that again, it is our holy purpose, it is our holy work to strive to be like God, to be the best that we can. I had hoped for question and answers. I recognize we don't have that time. Um, my email is Cantor Laura Stein, C-A-N-T-O-R, 
my name, L-A-U-R-A-S-T-E-I-N, Kendra Laura Stein, at gmail.com. Um, if you'd like to continue the conversation or get any resources for me, I would love to hear from you. I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of their Hag, Hag Sameach to you. May you learn and grow in this holiday um, and stay safe throughout the rest of the pandemic. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much, Kendra Laura Stein. That was fabulous.